Well, effects of that crash are being felt all over North America and the world. Sunday, the Lloydminster Junior B Bandits and Lloydminster Bobcats held a vigil at the Civic Centre to honour victims of the accident. Lance Phillips with more. Many in the Lloydminster community came together Sunday night to honour the victims of Friday's Humboldt Broncos bus crash. People throughout Alberta, Saskatchewan and Canada are reeling after 15 players, coaches and support staff were killed. You see pictures of the coach and his family and then you look at you know, my family and we got two young boys and, you know, and my wife and they're like, is it could have been us, you know, right? You know, it just really hits home and just, you know, you just want to hug your kids and, and your wife. Uh, really, it was just shock, not really believing it was happening. Um, still, still quite hasn't really settled in, um, just thinking about it. Speeches, prayers and a 7 p.m. moment of silence were observed, followed by an emotional rendition of Amazing Grace, performed by local artists Kenny Mack and Anthony Bender. One of the many reasons sorrow is being felt throughout small towns across this country is because the people that reside within them know exactly what teams like the Humboldt Broncos and Lloydminster Bobcats mean to these communities. Junior hockey makes, is, just makes a community, you know, it, uh, I don't know what Lloyd would do if they didn't have a junior program, it, it's huge. Oh, it's, it's everything, like when you're a kid growing up here, like you look up to this team and they mean the world to you. And, and you look at our season ticket, holders, season ticket holders who have been here forever. I think it's the focal point of the community. Um, I know we would have average of 1,200 fans per game during a regular season game, and that was that just goes to say how much that community supports uh, supports the team, and you're really proud to play there. Lance Phillips, Newcap News. Welcome back. The Lloydminster Catholic School Division is playing a key role in the grieving process for those directly affected by the Humboldt tragedy. The Catholic Division has sent two of their counselors to Humboldt. The staff is part of a team of about 30 counselors from across Saskatchewan who will assist the local schools and those dealing with the aftermath of Friday's devastating crash. It's a gift that our school division has and it's a gift that we're pleased to share uh, with a community that uh, needs it more this week than we will. And uh, we're pleased to be a part of that. LCSD has put counselling supports in place in all of the schools for students and staff who may require it in Lloydminster. The tragedy hitting close to home for many young athletes who rely on buses to get them to and from games. I think all of us that grew up in uh, rural Alberta and rural Saskatchewan understand what it is to be on buses for long, long distances. And if you played hockey as a young person or any other sport that we offer, we know that we're on buses uh, every day. And uh, so it's, it's an important thing to be able to be a part of the response uh, because we all know that by being acting together as a community, uh, all of us will be uh, stronger for it. LCSD schools will be participating in Jersey Day this Thursday to show their support. And the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League is setting up an assistance program that will provide grief counselling and mental health services. The Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League assistance program will raise funds for all people, both with the Humboldt Broncos organization and the other 11 SJHL teams who are deeply and directly affected by this awful event. Funding for the program is coming from the Federated Co-op, a company based in Saskatoon. Now, a local Rotary Club listened intently today to a resident involved in the mining of Bitcoin right here in Lloydminster. Steve Barber moved to the border city from Newfoundland in 2011 after being hired by Husky Energy. Barber soon left the company to follow his own endeavors, one of those being Bitcoin mining. One of the biggest problems in like the heavy oil industry, like around Lloyd, is that um, these 
these oil wells are producing natural gas as a byproduct, and it's really difficult to get the gas to the market. Barber uses what he calls a hash gen to harness any excess or wasted natural gas produced by oil wells to power a remote-controlled Bitcoin mining data center. We put that on oil wells for customers, basically oil companies, and, uh, and essentially they get paid for their, we pay them for, either it depends how the situation is, but they get paid for their natural gas. With Bitcoin being quite valuable, Upstream Data's tool is designed to decrease natural gas emission into the atmosphere while also generating revenue. When I heard about Bitcoin, I, just, yeah, I think there's a, a big future in Bitcoin. Um, I think it's widely misunderstood, uh, especially by most, uh, most, let's say, mainstream media. But uh, more and more people are starting to understand what it is and why it's uh, so powerful. For more information on Barber's business, you can visit his website. Well, the city of Cold Lake is relatively new to that title. Twenty years ago, three neighboring communities were in the process of amalgamating into one. But as we see in this week's retrospect, issues of sustainability that were present before the process began continue to affect the community today. It's a little early to abolish the ward system. There are some mixed feelings over electoral representation in Cold Lake. The Tritown area is now amalgamated into one community. And to ensure equal representation between Cold Lake North, Cold Lake South, and the air base, a ward system was established for the last civic election that allowed councillors to represent specific areas. It was the intent of the amalgamation committee that I sat on, as, as well as others, that that uh, the ward system should be a temporary thing to get us through the, through the amalgamation and then once that was, was done that we should revert to election at large uh, to signify that we were one community and could act that way. Though the ward system has since been eliminated and Cold Lake is officially recognized as a city, other issues persist. The town of Cold Lake, the town of Grand Centre, and Medley, which is four wing the military base, were thrown together to become the city in, in, in essence because of the financial hardship that the town of Coal Lake was going through. When Bob Buckle joined council in 2007, that financial hardship was still present. It was quite apparent that the city did not have sufficient uh, uh, assessment funds to sustain itself. We had a $350 million uh, liability on, on infrastructure. Uh, with ever de demands and uh, and uh, basically no no cash at the end of the budget to invest in itself. And recently, the province has cut back funding to the city by ten million dollars per year, or a loss of hundreds of millions for infrastructure programs over the next decade. Well, that's a heavy hit to take. So, but it's a wake up call because it does go back to the fact that the, the, the sustainability of the city is is could very much be a be an issue again moving forward. We're the largest urban center in this uh, in this region and uh, so we have a lot of a uh, lot of people that depend on us to to provide services and uh, and uh, look after the city of cold lake is currently discussing annexation with its neighbors to help improve sustainability for the future this is new cap sports well, traveling by a bus is a lifestyle for nearly all sports teams in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Friday's Humboldt Broncos tragedy is weighing heavy on the minds of many, including those who use the form of transportation regularly. Lance Phillips with more. It will be fresh for a long time. The Humboldt Broncos, a junior A hockey team, essentially wiped out in the blink of an eye. Tremors still being felt nearly three days after by local athletes and coaches who rely on a bus to move their teams thousands of kilometers every season. Pure shock. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that it happened. I, I felt so horrible for those families and, and their friends and everyone. Heartbreak. Um, to, to see that happen right away, obviously I talked to my wife about it and the immediate discussion that we had was that could easily be our team. On the bus, you're not, you're not paying attention to what's on the road necessarily. You're, you know, you're locked in, you're, you're playing cards, you're, talking with your buddies, you're just having a good time, preparing for a game, and for something like that to happen, and, and it would have been so fast, it's, 
it's scary to me. On those buses is a sort of bus culture, a set of ideas, values, a way of life that has been handed down over decades, a rite of passage that after Friday has been injured, just like 14 of the 29 young people on that fateful journey to Nipawin. But what constitutes the values of bus culture? It's the time when you're bonding with your teammates. It's a safe place. It's, it's a place to look forward to. I think it's a team building opportunity for players where players get uh, those relationships that they create that last a lifetime. It's your safe place and uh, it's how you guys become brothers. That's your safe place, right? Uh, where you get to open up and just be who you are and hang out with your buddy and chit chat, tell stories and laugh. It, it allows the group to bond and, and really come together and and it makes a big difference, I think, in the, in the culture of the team. And it really does make or break teams, depending on how, how they take that opportunity. Now, the mindset almost certainly changes next time a game on the road approaches. I think it's going to weigh on guys for a little bit. I think it might take a little bit of time to be comfortable on a bus again. To, to see something like this happen to a group of young men is absolutely awful. And it will be in everyone's mind every time they step on a bus or a long trip. When junior hockey players aren't on a bus, they're here, enjoying time in their sanctuary, the dressing room. And in Humboldt, that safe haven will forever bear the spirits of 15 souls lost on Friday. Lance Phillips, Newcap Sports, Lloyd Minster. This is Newcap Weather with Gerard Lampa. Welcome back everyone. While we seem to be still on tap to get some warmer temperatures, we head towards the middle of the month. We get a one day so-called warm up this week and then Wednesday is really the question mark day. So let's begin to look at the next 24 hours and put this map into motion there. There you go. There's a ridge of the jet stream building in nicely from the south. Some of the cooler air is still aloft there. Mix of sun and cloud going forward there. But you can see the areas of precipitation beginning to encroach as this map stops at uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. So hints of freezing rain. That looks like just off of the QE2. So that's well out of our area still. But there's the snow for areas northwest of Edmonton. And there's some rain in there as well. And that mix will continue pushing in this direction. So the question is, if we warm up tomorrow, and if you begin to look at those temperatures, a warm up is certainly on, on are possible, three and threes and twos, four in the case of Pierce Land, four even if you're heading out to Edmonton. And so with that warmer air available aloft, some of that precipitation could start off as rain. And depending on the time that it starts off, it'll turn back into ice on the surface. And for our area, it looks like it might catch up with us on the overnights and into Wednesday morning. And that'd probably be the worst case scenario, what we're dealing with. Uh, there's probably about on the low end, four centimeters, and on the high end, maybe six centimeters of this to contend with. Towns off to our northeast for tomorrow, three in Green Lake, two for Meadow Lake, St. Wolberg, two as well in the Battlefords, and four is around Provost and Macklin areas. Let's head across the country, 11 a mix of sun and cloud in Vancouver, similar skies in Edmonton for their plus six, plus nine in Whitehorse, so minus eight though in Yellowknife, minus one in Regina for a mix of sun and cloud, taking a quick look at Winnipeg for their plus one, mainly sunny skies, overcast and cloudy in Toronto for plus one, minus five in Quebec, minus two in Halifax, mainly clear evening there, some snow showers in St. John's for minus two, and it's minus 20, clear skies in Iqaluit. Let's come on back to the prairies, stop in the Battlefords for minus two, a sunny sun, sunny skies, uh, blue skies, yeah, minus 10 in the early hours of the morning and with the winds around 15 kilometers, maybe 20 kilometers per hour there, the wind chill on that will be around minus 20 in time for the morning commute, plus two during the course of the day and into the afternoon for the Battlefords and area. At the moment, plus three in Cold Lake. Some cloud cover pushing across the region, yes. Minus nine towards the early hours of tomorrow morning. And then looking for plus three during the course of the afternoon. The wind shifting from west and southwest to east, anywhere from 10 to 20 kilometers per hour across the Lakeland region. 
Let's come on back at home now. Lloydminster, Vermilion, Wainwright, Provost areas. The Midwest region is sitting on the freezer still in this hour. West winds at about 15 kilometers per hour, so making it feel just a little cooler down to minus 4. Minus 7 in the early hours of the morning. And with a 15K wind on that, you're certainly going to be dealing with a wind chill anywhere from about minus 11 through to about minus 15. This morning we were at uh, minus 10 with a minus 16 feel around 7 o'clock this morning. So the start of the morning commute tomorrow, similar conditions. Yes, and looking for plus 2 in the afternoon. So warmer tomorrow than what we've seen in the last little while, but it's Wednesday is the bug mark. And I think overnight Tuesday and into Wednesday, that's when we'll see how this thing will develop. Minus 1 at best on Wednesday, a little windy, probably 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Minus 2 on Thursday, 0 Friday, plus 4 on Saturday, plus 7 Sunday, plus 2 next Monday, and the wind returning again. So the question mark is really on Wednesday, Brian. It's back to you now for Agriculture News.